on this episode of the Mind, Body and Soul podcast with John Morris. Join John and his special guest Tamika Shelton as they get to grips with and discuss the movement that is Black Lives Matter. Join them as they discuss what it means to be a black woman in America. Tamika's battles and struggle, past and present being a black woman in America, and how we can learn to change. That and so much more in today's episode of the Mind, Body and Soul podcast with John Morris. Welcome to the Mind, Body and Soul podcast with John Morris. Inspiring, motivating and educating you in finding balance in the craziness of day-to-day life. Learn from and listen to a man who has a wealth of life experience, from business to bodybuilding, artist to author, and has learned to deal with his own physical and mental wells. But that's not all. Each week John interviews and picks the minds of special guests from all around the world and from all walks of life. From actors to authors, wrestlers to warriors, business owners to life coaches, and so much more. Welcome to today's episode of the Mind, Body, and Soul podcast with John Morris. Okay, folks, and welcome to another exciting episode of the Mind, Body, and Soul podcast. I am your host, as always, John Morris, and welcome to the podcast that helps you find balance in the day-to-day craziness of your life. I am really excited and just really thrilled about today's show because we are going to be tackling and talking about a really, really uh, relevant but really, really difficult topic as well with one of my dearest, dearest friends I've known now for nearly a decade. She is a wonderful, wonderful lady and has so much life experience to give as well. I want to welcome the author, Tamika Sheldon. Tamika, how are you doing today? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. The sun's actually just come out here in glorious Scotland. It's beaming through the windows. (laughs) You see what's going on behind me. It's like so much light. How's the weather over there, actually? The weather is pretty cool. Um, And it's cool, meaning uh, we kind of skipped from the like the transition between summer and fall yep. and went from summer directly into <laughs> that's, that's like Scotland. I often tell people we've got two seasons, summer and winter. And that's <laughs> about it. <laughs> so we, make- normally, we normally have four, but not this time. It's, it's been a very, very strange year. And I know we're going to talk about that today in depth. Uh, Tamika, for those who maybe have never met you before, know very little about you, tell us a little bit about yourself. <sighs> okay. Where do we start? <laughs> right. There's a whole lot of different things to tell you about Tamika. Um, so I'll tell you about the professional Tamika first. Um, I, my name is Tamika Shelton, and I own a human resources consulting company called Employ and Relate. Um, and it's really just a company where what we want to do is inspire employers to not only get folks in and recruit them, but actually relate to them, relate to people at holistically, not leave your personal self outside and come in here, but we want them to relate holistically. And what I find is once you relate to a person in general, there's a different connection that happens. And um, when when you show that you care, then people often show that they're they care back. Absolutely, and it's, it's a different way of doing business, and it's totally different from uh, what normal corporate HR, the philosophy of HR is like. So that's what I do uh, as a professional, and that that way of being has kind of spilled over into certain aspects of my life. I used to have a podcast myself um, that was called Living Powerfully Mm -hmm. and basically transitioning from giving away your power into a world where you can take that power back and and live your fullest and, and just kind of be the best that you can be. So I'm really, really excited. I am a work in progress both professionally and personally trying to live my best life. So that's me. 
and I have two dogs walking around my feet. <laughs> so if you see me like, <laughs> then you know what's going on. We've I got a cat that some. We've got a cat that sometimes will walk across the screen when we're doing the middle of filming and just sit down and, you know, it's all happy. But talking about the podcast, I think that's originally where we met with Anna Renault, if I remember correctly. Uh, Anna, who's, uh, who was an author, is sadly no longer with us, um, really, really helped boost a lot in my career. And I think for a lot of other people as well, which was uh, fantastic. But Tamika, you know, we're talking about something um, specifically today. And, and the, first of all, the, the work that you do in, because I, do, I, do, I, don't, I don't want to move away from this too quickly, but the work that you do in encouraging businesses to actually get to know their staff as people um, is an amazing thing because for so long, business owners and professionals had just been, you come in, you do what I tell you, I pay you, you go. Um, and I think, you know, a lot of people, and I know I've been there, you know, certainly felt undervalued and undercared for and, and everything else. Um, with the podcast, oddly enough, because people are now starting to see that what we do is actually uh, about caring for other people and about helping other people. We've got guests in, and even minor celebrities at the moment that are, you know, on, on the list and on the schedule for, uh, for doing podcasts, which is absolutely phenomenal. Um, oh, awesome. and well, one of the, the things, if I can give anybody that's looking to do a podcast advice, it, it would be this, um, that once a celebrity, if, if you're in communication with them, once a celebrity knows that you aren't just wanting to talk about their professional side, but you're also wanting to talk about the person behind it, they are more than willing, often or not, if, if you've got enough credentials behind you to actually really, really help. Um, and like you, I'm, I'm really excited and thrilled about today. Um, because we're, we're talking about the, the very, very relevant subject, Black Lives Matter. And I had obviously was doing a lot of research and um, different thoughts was coming into my mind. Uh, 2020 has been a very, very strange year for everybody around the globe. There's no, there's no doubt about that. It's like, well done, John, for stating the obvious. But, but the, the, uh, I think the thing that's most relevant in people's minds right now is uh, certainly a couple of things that we're going to talk about, obviously about COVID-19 and coronavirus, um, you know, Black Lives Matter certainly, and uh, there's going to be a couple of other topics that I do want to touch on as well today. Tamika, for, for those who don't know and aren't really clear about Black Lives Matter and, and the movement that's there, can you explain to us what, what, it, what it's really all about? So I'll explain it from my perspective yeah. because I am not officially part of the Black Lives Matter organization. Um, it, but I, I have definitely read what they are about and I feel comfortable uh, associating myself with it. And um, basically what's happened is we've come to a place where a lot of black people have been shot and killed by police officers for one strange reason or another. It's like in the first couple of times, it's like, huh, man, that's awful that it yeah. happened. Um, and then the next few times, it's like, man, that is really bad. You feel bad for people. Yeah. And then the numbers start to get such that it's like, whoa, mm -hmm. something's not right here. Um, it's, you know, you never want to discount a life. And um, what happens, of course, is it started being a disproportionate amount of lives that were uh, being lost and, and at the hands of uh, police officers. Yeah. It's like, what in the world mm -hmm. is going on? And so this sentiment started, um, and I think it, the Black Lives Matter movement started around what happened between uh, Trayvon Martin and George Zimmerman, and mm -hmm. then George Zimmerman wasn't held to account. Uh -huh. I think the, the date that I've got was like 2013, because I didn't realize it began as early as that, but apparently mm -hmm. the movement was starting back then. Um, the it's now just coming. Yeah, the movement was starting back mm -hmm. then, and... Um, you know, people, what what needs to be understood is saying Black Lives Matter or understanding that Black Lives Matter has nothing to do with taking away from anyone else. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It actually is 
for lack of a better way of saying it, it's like when, when we sit in the mirror and say, mm -hmm. man, you are great. You are great. You're going to make it, <laughs> you know, um, I, I, you know, we, we have all this self-talk that we do so that we can start to, uh, manifest positive things in our lives. And I would say that saying that Black Lives Matter is no different. It, it's one of those things to reiterate to yourself as a Black person that you do matter, despite what you might see around you. Yeah. You matter. Yeah, yeah. And the other thing is to make sure that those who are continually doing these things that um, it appears as if they don't look at the life of a black person mm. the same way they look at a life of someone who's not black. Yep. Try to reiterate to you know it, it for some reason um, the the life of a black person is doesn't appear to be as valued. And in turn, we have to keep reminding ourselves mm -hmm. that Black Lives Matter. Yeah. And we want to put it out into the universe that Black Lives Matter. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, no, absolutely. That does. And I think that's a fantastic way of putting it. My, my own personal belief is every life is sacred, whether it's a human being, whether it's an animal, whatever it is. Um, you know, it, it's, it's shocking in some ways that people forget and, and my own personal belief is that at one point in time, many, many thousands of years ago, we were all one. We traveled together, you know, we spent time together. And then it was all a case of, well, I want to go north and I want to go south. And then there was a split and then there was another split and so on and so on and so on. And it's just in, in some ways crazy to think that, you know, because of what whatever supremacy that people think, I know we're going to talk about this, and, and it's certainly a topic that I want to uh, discuss with you later on, um, about, you know, a, a race that feels it's supreme to everybody else. And you kind of think, well, where, where did this start from? You know, wh wh where did it even originate from? And, you know, how can people, I mean, I'm still flabbergasted now in 2020 that people could still believe this and treat other human beings the way that they do. Um, it, it, it's crazy as a historian, you know, I, I've heard and seen, you know, the stories, uh, some from firsthand accounts of, of things that happened in the 1700s with the slave ships. And, and you just think this is just insane, you know, just- It's, it's weird. Yeah, it is. There's no other word for it. it it's literally just, it's insanity. <laughs> it's, it's so weird and and i'm told you know and i i truly have not gone back too far in history but i'm told that some something happened from a church perspective mm -hmm. yep that created this and here's the thing at this point i don't even care how it started <laughs> could it just end already that's it um, could there and and unfortunately I don't know how it is where where you are, but where we are here in America, it's not even everybody doesn't even agree that there's yeah. a problem. Yeah, I mean, and, and that's a really crazy thing, um, you know. And and again, I cannot understand how people can just say, "Well, that's acceptable" or "That's fine." Um, Tamika, I want to touch on uh, as well, because I've heard part of your stories before um, when you did the interview with Dave Perdue in the NAMS group. And particularly a story that we're talking about was one of your first days in the office. You're a young woman and there was one of your friends that was there. Can you remember the story that we're talking about? Yes. <laughs> Would you be willing to share that story? Because I, I'm, I'm still flabbergasted now. It got me hot when I, when I heard it. I know it ends well, but still, <laughs> so go ahead. Yes. So I worked at one of our agencies, um, Department of Defense, and a, a high agency that everybody hears about. And as a high school work study, um, when I first got to the agency, I was introduced to the person I was going to work with. And um, she had never had that much exposure to working with a young Black woman. Um, and 
there were so many different things that happened during my first week. I remember her telling me that she could tell by my name that I was black. Um, and she said something about if, if uh, I didn't like to work, that this wouldn't be the place for me. Later on, she asked me if I called my mother, mama, and I called my father, papa. Like she was asking me all of these weird things that mm -hmm. you would see on television. Like yeah. later on, I learned that she got all of this stuff from television. Um, but the one thing that ultimately happened after we got uh, it, uh, too close, probably, she definitely felt too close to me is uh, one day I, I used to have my hair really long and um, on my 18th birthday. So I started this high school work study when I was in 10th grade. So we had been together for a while at this point. On my 18th birthday, my mom allowed me to cut my hair. So I cut my hair from long to short, like you see now, but I had these three tails in the back and um, she didn't like it. She didn't like it at all. And what she did, because her desk was behind my desk, she was complaining about it. Why'd you get your hair that way? I told you not to do it in the first place. The next thing you know, she comes by my desk. She cuts off one of these tails that I had hanging and sets the tail on the desk as well as the scissors and just walks off. And unfortunately, that particular action created the biggest EEOC mm -hmm. uh, investigation that that I've ever experienced, but that a lot of people at the agency ever experienced. Wow, and I mean, you know, I again, I have, I have a belief that nobody, regardless of sexual orientation, gender, color, et cetera, et cetera. Um, ever has the right to touch anybody else. Um, you know, you, you can say what you like, and if, if you don't agree with something, that's fine. But when you start putting your hands on somebody else, that is really crossing the line. And mm -hmm. I've got a personal problem with that. You're, you know, I mean, probably what, in your late teens, early 20s, when when this takes place? So I, it was my... 18th birthday, so I, I just turned 18. Wow. So, I mean, it's, it's like welcome to the world of work here. Um, <laughs> you know, and, I, and I mean, I've been deal, dealt some pretty crappy deals over the years, but I've never had anybody, you know, dare come up and, and physically, you know, touch me. What was your emotional state at that point? I was stunned, but I was not stunned from the same perspective of the people who wound, wound up creating the EEO complaint. Yeah. Um, I was on the phone with my mother, actually, as it was, as it happened. And I said, I can't believe she just cut my hair. But I was stunned from a how dare her just yeah. cut my hair. But that was the extent of my stunnedness. Yeah. Um, as I said, she says so many other things. Um, and we had gone back and forth about what it means to be black and uh, there have been so many questions over time. So in my mind, although she is white, yeah. it did not, it didn't register to me the mm -hmm. same way it registered to other people. Had it been my first day or my first week or when she was doing all of the initial questioning about my blackness, mm -hmm. I probably would have thought that way. Yeah. Now, since we have, since I've told everybody what happened, <laughs> Um, <laughs> and actually she and I have gone back to talk about it. Mm -hmm. The question is, did she still feel a sense of righteousness uh -huh. and being able to do it that way because she is white? I, I don't know. Um, it was stunning. Mm -hmm. So many people were so angry. Yeah. Oh, I, I mean, I can imagine. And it's, you know, I don't even start, think that it's, it stops with someone's color. I think because I mean, I, I've got long hair, obviously, right. um, as I'm getting older, it's getting shorter and shorter. But <laughs> the, the reality is, is I've had people in ministry, you know, saying you need to cut that ponytail off, you know, or I'll give me a pair of scissors and I'm going to do that. And to me, that's very threatening behavior. Now, I cannot imagine knowing what I know of the United States and what we're going to touch on momentarily 
someone just coming up and cutting my hair off. Because genuinely, as, as much as I try to remain calm, I think my fist would have been down their throat, <laughs> quite honestly. Um, because, I mean, I remember that, you know, when you told it for the first time and I just sat there, I was like, how dare somebody feel that they've got the right to, to do that? Um, and, and like you say, I mean, I think there are so many misconceptions um, because of TV mm -hmm. and e even social media. Now, I grew up in Huddersfield, which had, and, and I was thinking about this yesterday before we were obviously uh, speaking to you, but I grew up in Huddersfield, West Yorkshire, and um, I grew up with every ethnicity going except probably Hispanic. And, mm -hmm. you know, I, I have seen the level that some people will go to because they hate Pakistani folk or they hate folks, you know, that are black. I mean, our, uh, our, our town, I guess you'd say, was set up into districts. There was one for the blacks, there was one for the, the Pakistani there was, and, and Indians, oh, there was one for the, the British and the whites and things. And it got to a stage where, you know, I, and I know firsthand that, that there were some people that were uh, letter bombing uh, certain families and certain communities. And again, all because of their color and things and like this. During the time that, you know, you, you're going through all of these things. And the reason that I bring this up is because I know the United States in particular, one of the things it's famous for is gang culture. Was there ever anything like that near where you were and where you were growing up? Um, I was pretty sheltered as okay. a, a young person, which is probably why my response to mm -hmm. my hair being cut was not um, the way that most people would have responded. Mm -hmm. um, I wasn't allowed to go to the mall with my friends until I was 18 either. Right. So there was a lot of uh, protection, insulation um, because of a traumatic childhood that my mother had. Okay. So, I wasn't able to go out. So I don't know enough about gangs at the time. I didn't even know, just as something else weird. In high school, somebody had um, fireworks that went off right. and people thought it was guns. Wow. And I didn't know uh -huh. that when guns are shot, you're supposed to get down. Yeah. So I'm sitting up <laughs> in the cafeteria <laughs> looking at everybody like, what? Yeah. Why what are you doing down there? <laughs> right. And, and everybody's like, get Joe here. I'm like, what are they doing? So mm -hmm. I have to be honest to say that I was I was a bit sheltered. Mm -hmm. So I can't I can't I, I don't know about gangs. I, I find it interesting that the phrase that you used as well, that your mom had, had a traumatic experience. I was talking with another lady um this past week. She said the exact same thing and how that affected her in the raising of her children. Was your mom particularly overprotective knowing all of the, um, I suppose, all of what could be basically? My mom was very, very, very overprotective. And um, it was, it, it has handicapped me uh, a lot okay. uh, over the years. And actually my brother and how he raises his black son mm -hmm. um, and, we're learning as a family right now some of the impact of how we were raised yeah. and unfortunately my mom feels very bad uh it's it's sad to see some of the uh -huh. things that are happening but yeah she was very overprotective and in turn i was not ready or prepared yeah. for the ways of the world i wasn't prepared when i went to this job to hear this lady keep asking me uh, questions about me being black. I mean, I really had, yeah. I, 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 I just so much was over my head. Um, but my mom has a very forgiving spirit mm -hmm. and in turn, she tends to, and, and this comes from a place of trauma. Yeah. She tends to, uh, be very forgiving and understand where a person is coming from at the time. They only yeah. know what they know at the time. So, I tended to be very forgiving. That's why I was like, man, she lost her mind cutting my hair, but I can't get my hair back. That's it. I mean, once the thing- That was it. Yeah, I mean, once it's done, it's done. You know, right. once an action has been carried out, that is that is the point of it. Um, right. Talking about actions, actually, that kind of leads on um, to, I suppose, in, in, in the modern day, and I know we're going to be flitting backwards and forwards between time periods today, 
2020, obviously, we've had, um, <laughs> and again, stating the obvious, John, we've had a major outbreak that has, you know, basically changed the way that the, the way that everything functions. I know we were talking about this off air um, with COVID-19. And one of the things that I found really interesting, and again, I don't know if it's people's passions. I don't know if it's social media hype. I don't know if it's the media's hype, but I want to get your thoughts on this, that, okay. you know, again, what was reported was 10,000 people during lockdown were meeting together to do um, these protests and these rallies for basically after uh, the, the policeman had been, I think, more or less let off mm -hmm. um, with, with a lot of things. And then the, the decision was later on changed, um, if my memory serves me correctly. What was your kind of feeling? Because I, I know me, when I saw 10,000 people meeting together uh, in the United States, and I'm thinking, well, they're not socially distancing, there's no masks on or anything. Like this is what's running through my head in the middle of a global pandemic. Um, What's kind of running through your head when these things and, and you start seeing all these masses of people um, very passionately protesting and obviously what would happen afterwards, which was the, the mass uh, riots? So I, I would have preferred that there be um, no protests that were violent. I unfortunately and this is this is where so many things get just, just kind of get there's a line right mm -hmm. yeah so to me i saw what a lot of masks um and i see that like let's say if you were to take our president's rap do you struggle with motivation feel yourself procrastinating a lot have amazing ideas and dreams but struggle with the concepts of how to get from where you are to where you want to be or maybe looking for something a little bit simpler, like wanting to get fit, or maybe wanting to lose a few pounds and tighten things up. Are you someone that struggles with anxiety or trauma or even depression? You're not alone. Many people around the world do. Hi folks, I'm John Morris. And for the last two decades, I've been working with people from all over the world in all walks of life to really understand human beings, the concept, the behaviors, and ultimately the reasons why. And I've had the privilege of coaching and working with folks just like you that maybe are struggling with anxiety or depression or trauma or wanting to get ahead, wanting to maybe build some long-term success but have no idea how to begin. This is what I do. And with John Morris Life Coaching, you're in really, really good hands. Why can I say this? Because you're not only going to get an experienced life coach, you're also going to get somebody that has a wide variety of experiences, from youth ministry and working with teenagers and children, to someone who's worked with drug addicts and alcoholics, people that have day-to-day -day dependency issues, to, to somebody maybe just like you, that just wants that little bit of encouragement, wants that little bit of motivation, and wants support to get to that next level. With John Morris Personal Life Coaching, you're in really good hands. A lot of my clients would tell you if they were here now that one of the greatest assets to John Morris Life Coaching is you can see things exactly as you want to see them without fear of being controlled and conformed like a lot of therapists and coaches do. We help you right where you're at to get to the place that you want to be, step by step, to figure out a plan. So if this sounds like something that you would be interested in, having that support, motivation, encouragement, and even education should you need it, then get in touch with me today. I would love to hear from you. Places are limited, so please don't delay. We've got a very, very small window of opportunity remaining. We all need help from time to time, but the difference between success and failure, achieving our dreams and maybe just letting our dreams go by, depends on the level of help that we have available and that we're willing to accept. So get in touch with me today at John Morris Life Coaching. You'll be glad you did, and I'll see you soon. Um, that have a lot of white people, even though they have mixed, but yeah. it's predominantly white versus uh, black people protesting. Black people know that COVID is impacting black people more yeah. Yeah. than anyone else. In turn, the level of masks that mm -hmm. you saw were significant. Were there people who took their masks off or didn't wear masks? Yes. Um, but I, I don't think the proportion was uh, now socially distanced. Yeah. I definitely <laughs> did that. And, and in turn, I took my protest to Facebook rather than going out there. Uh -huh. 
at the same time, what I had to learn, and it, because there still was internal judgment of course. from me um, on how do you do this during COVID. Mm-hmm. Um, and I had to learn that some things, John, are just worth fighting for. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, um, some things are, you know, it, you're killing us already. Mm-hmm. So kill us fighting yeah or fighting for some for something good Mm -hmm. uh starting good trouble uh and now as far as riots and um looting and things of that nature goes uh it's not my thing Mm -hmm. um i can't imagine you being a rioter (laughs) (laughs) i've only been in one fight in my life and i'll have to tell you about that later if you haven't heard about it I would love uh, to hear about that. Oh, it, it's going to be the funniest story you've ever heard. Uh, but if there's time, I'll tell you. But Absolutely. yeah, I, I am not a fighter like that. I am also not a marcher. So number one, I'm outside for five minutes. I don't like to be hot. Mm-hmm. My feet and back are going to hurt. I'm short and chubby. <laughs> you don't want me to try to run away from a police. I probably will flip and, or fall down or something. So I'm not the girl. Um, but I do know that there are certain things that you have to be extreme yeah. to get attention. I agree. Our president yeah. is, is a very good example. He's extreme. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he gets a lot of attention. Mm-hmm. Good, bad, or indifferent. Yeah. He can be extreme good. He can be extreme bad. He's getting attention. Oh, yeah, right? Absolutely. And I think that some people believe that this gets attention. Mm -hmm. We also have people who are opportunists. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And then we also had people who took the opportunity to dress in all black Mm -hmm. and mix in with a sea of black people and create issues that were not uh, of the protesters doing. And it actually were white people Mm -hmm. who were doing things to try to provoke and instigate issues. So there was so much, but let me tell you, when people are hurt and they're tired and they've had enough, they're willing to take certain risks. And again, I had to go back and even my mind and stop judging the people and try to understand they're fighting for me. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. No different than when our military goes and puts themselves in harm's way for me. They're doing this for me. Yeah. Our military does this for me. And let me tell you who's not going to do it for y'all. I'm not going out. Y'all don't want me to shoot nobody because I beat and shot myself. You know, like <laughs> I'm not the one. I appreciate uh what's happening um i would like people to get in good trouble and i would i i hate to see if a black person if i saw them on television and taking something out of stores or or but again when you're fighting for your life yeah. who's to say what's the right way to fight for your life I think that's really, really fantastic the way that you so eloquently put that um, because the, the whole thing is, you know, I think after so many times of, you know, being nice for lack of a better term about things, there does come a point where you either say, I've either got to accept the way that things are now, or I've got to stand up regardless of the consequences and you know um you know and fight and and a lady that's just shot literally straight into my head as an example was rosa parks um obviously when she stood up on that bus and said no i'm I'm not moving here and that was a big big thing at that point um despite her being arrested she stood for her you know moral belief she stood for something um and i think sometimes that people are lacking again for lack of a better term in in that conviction in themselves especially now but then you've got a lot of people who ha- are really really um you know strong in their convictions and strong in their beliefs um and again you know I, every single week that i do this it seems to be now is the time for so many changes with the lgbt 
uh, queue. I'm, I'm losing letters here and everything else. That's right. there. But, but you know what I mean? And, and obviously Black Lives Matter, those have been two massive things um, within, gosh, the last two years maybe, uh, that's really come more to the forefront of people's minds and, and starting to change in an amazing way, which is fantastic. Um, I suppose in some ways, like you, I find it kind of strange because growing up the way that I did with black kids, white kids, you know, green Martians from space and, and you know, Indian kids and all the others, I never thought at any point of anything being any different or anything was weird or strange with them. It was more from the previous generations um, from the 60s, 70s, and a lot of it was parental influence as well. 2020 is, again, I know we've, we've covered this, has certainly been an interesting year. And one of the things I wanted to kind of touch on, because it was one of the questions that's been asked to me, it's something that I personally have experienced as well. And I'm sure you may be able to resonate with what I'm about to say, the whole thing of white supremacy. And now, again, trying to choose my words very carefully, my prayer when the Black Lives Matter movement um, was so dominant on Instagram and Facebook and everything else, and I actually said this publicly several times, was that when, the, the, when it stops trending and stops being cool, I hope people are still on, you know, on, on, that, on the, the movement. One thing that I was not expecting was uh, particularly white people to get in touch with me and then start telling me, uh, you know, how I should basically renounce my who I am, and because I'm a white man, um, renounce who I am because of stuff that happened four or five hundred years ago. Like you said, you know, you can't do anything about the past, but you can certainly, you know, do stuff moving on in the future. And everybody's got fault. You know, every race, gender, creed, whatever has got fault somewhere. Um, and, and I guess, you know, you at some point must have had people that, you know, said, well, you're a black lady, you know, and that that's it, you know, that there isn't, you know, anything more just the same as, you know, I'm a white guy, you know, you should denounce who you are. Do you think it's right for people to denounce who they who they are? What would you respond to something like that is, is really what I suppose I'm getting at. So give me a little. Tell me what your a brief definition of denounce means for you. Okay, so if, if I'm going along the, the lines of what the message uh, was to me, um, basically, directly it said, you're a white man and you should publicly, because I'm in the public eye, you should publicly apologize for, they did mention a specific name and I've forgotten who it was, it's just gone out of my head, but basically you should apologize for the actions of this man in this time period. Um, and basically, you know, almost, almost denounce who you are, you know, but be shameful the fact that you're white. Got it. Um, so I don't, I don't think anybody should feel ashamed for who they are. Um, I don't think that there's a need to feel ashamed or to, um, there's just no need. Even the, let's say, just uh, for lack of a better way of saying this, you have those people whose parents were uh, serial killers. Yeah. Their children do not need yeah. to feel bad for who they are because they are whole complete individuals mm -hmm. who are separate and apart from their parents. And, um, you know, so that's number one. I do think that there's this thing about, and I hope I'm getting the answer to your question. You know how people are taking down statues? Yes, yeah. Um, I don't have a problem with taking down statues. I don't think statues hold history. Mm -hmm. I think your mind, your uh, history holds history. Yeah, yeah. The statue, not you can put the history in the books, but it's a depiction. Mm -hmm. So for a lot of years, Black people have been told to forget who they are, mm -hmm. where they came from, because we're supposed to assimilate into this particular culture. Yeah. Um, 
I think that sometimes in an effort to feel better, um, it would be great for some to hear somebody apologize yeah. for the consistency that's happened as it relates to discrimination and racism. And I think sometimes it, it's kind of like grasping for straws for what you think will make you feel better. Um, just like reparations, a lot of people are talking about reparations right now, like yeah. black people are owed something. And what is that? I, 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 and that black people will always be behind given how we were introduced. There is a grasping of straws for making things better. Yeah. But what made it worse is to try to hide and not accept the fact that it even is. Yeah, yeah. So to keep telling Black people that what you're thinking isn't happening, what you're experiencing really isn't what you're yeah. experiencing. This doesn't happen here. All of these sorts of things. So I think, again, it's there's so many things that make up why we ha and how we get to the place where we're having folks yeah. trying to denounce who they are. Yeah. Um, and I think it's a grasp at just trying to be acknowledged, to have pain acknowledged, to have your your existence acknowledged yeah. and, and how you've been treated acknowledged, like all of those things. Mm. Um, but it's a grasp at straws. What, what will make us feel better? When we come yeah. into this world, we come in with a sense of awe and wonder, believing that things will work out for the best, filled with excitement. We play like children and we enjoy our lives. But as we get older, we find out that everything maybe isn't as rosy as we first thought it would be. Live life long enough and you realize that what once seemed like happy families can very quick turn into Dungeons and Dragons. Have you ever experienced anxiety, worry, or maybe even fear on an insane level? I want to let you know right here, right now, that you're not alone. Everything from homelessness, betrayal by my best friend, abandonment from the people that I thought would have my back. In fact, I've experienced so many different situations. To tell you all would take a very, very long time indeed. But the good news is I'm here to tell you that, well, they've left their mark on me. I've come through all of them. There is a light at the end of the tunnel. And I've got a brand new book. It's called The Battles That We All Face. This book is designed to give you encouragement. It's designed to give you hope. It's designed to teach you, to challenge you, to get you to think a little bit more. The full title is, The Battles We All Face a Devotional with a Difference. Because I don't want you to just read it from start to finish. I want you to take time over this. I want you to read the first chapter and really process it. This book is designed, if nothing more, as I said, to challenge you, to encourage you, to give you hope. But ultimately to let you know so whatever you're facing, you, my friend, are not alone. I want to encourage you right now to not let fear or the past stop you from living an amazing, amazing life. Each page in this book has one of my art pieces in it and has been specifically placed there to give you, the reader, an association to the subject discussed. Please don't delay. You owe it to yourself to start rebuilding your life. Life is not over until you draw your last. Don't delay. Order today. Life is short. You owe it to yourself, as long as you're drawing breath, to stand up and fight for the things that you want in life. And my friend, you've got an ally in me who understands completely what you're going through. Have an awesome day. Click that link below, and I'll see you on the other side. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, again, that, you know, that was really well put because I think a lot of times when, again, it's like little children, when they've done something wrong, uh, you know, they, they, they try to cover it up and they try to get people to forget about it and everything. But I think there is a lot of healing 
in, again, the apology. I think there's a lot of healing in acceptance of what has been, but also then the question of how we move forward. Um, one question that I'm interested in from the, the point that obviously you were you were a child and you're explain you, you know you're you're experiencing all these things to where you are now in 2020 have you seen a lot of change go on for the black community i have seen a lot of change um in the black community but it probably isn't the change that you would see okay um I think that we, like where I grew up, we, it was an integrated school. Um, when I was little, we were still all friends, that sort of thing. But I've always known that there was a difference between me and somebody who's white. Okay. So I've grown up with that Yeah. because we had to have the talk because my parents would never have known you know, how uh, I would, they, they were hopeful that I didn't run into any problems, yeah. but if you do, um, just know that you're different. And it actually, this is going to be a controversial statement. It's okay. <laughs> we kind of treated white people as supreme. Okay. So um, there, uh, because that's just how it was. Yeah. I think there was a lot of conditioning, certainly that you know, um, you know, e even probably up to the eighties and nineties, you know, the, the, there was no black president at that point. You know, it had always been a white man. Even after, so even once Barack Obama was was elected, mm -hmm. the condition, the mindset of black people, actually all people, know, just for, just to be honest, yeah. that white people are considered supreme. Uh -huh. so it's all of us yeah. Who, yeah. who know this, whether or not we we accept it or not. Um, like I even forgot forgot the, the question that you were asking. Um, I, I think I, 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 I've, I've lost my own trail of thought there, but I think it was uh, along the lines of, you know, how the changes that you- Oh, the changes. Yeah. yeah. So what happened was to me in my life, things were like this and I didn't have to deal with it much. Okay. And as I got older, I had to deal with it more. Okay. And then I started going into the workplace. I had to deal with it more. Yeah. And then I became in management and it was more like, so if anything, what I thought was going to get better yeah. and then drop. Right has got was here and then just skyrocketed wow. right. and the more i became educated the more money that i got mm -hmm. the more position uh titles that i've advanced to the more white people that i encountered try to take that away from me wow Wow, that, that's because i was i was going to actually ask you that Re regarding the the workplace um what kind of, and, I, and I'm almost certain that, that you will have certain stories to tell and whatever you feel comfortable talking about, uh, please do feel free. But what kind of prejudice did you encounter, certainly in the workplace? Obviously, you mentioned the story earlier on where someone locked those Goldilocks off and, uh, you know, took, took advantage. But, <laughs> right. you know, I, I hear stories all the time, unfortunately, from people in the workplace of, of all ethnicities of people taking advantage. What were some of the ones that you really experienced? So with, without, because I can't, there's so many, it just was a daily thing. Right. Um, I remember when President Obama was elected, I worked for a government contracting organization that uh, produced things for war efforts. Right. Uh, that's all I can basically say. Yeah, yeah. So defense contracting and defense contracting is normally a Republican supported type of organization. I didn't know this until I started working there. Wow. And I started working there in 2007. And that was my last job before I started my own business yep. in 2014. So I learned a lot about Republicans um, and the war efforts and why they didn't want to 
have a democratic president. Okay. Like this is where I learned the most. Yeah. But I'll never forget the all of the management, the director level team of which I was part of the management team at the time, but I was the only one who wasn't a director. Right. Um, the only black person. Wow. Um, and they, the director team along with the CEO were in my office talking about the stupid Democrats who voted for Barack Obama and the black people who just voted for him because he's black. Wow. They had no problem yeah. <laughs> that here they're in my office. Yeah. And so I said, hey guys, <laughs> hey, like I'm one of the stupid Democrats who voted for him uh -huh. and I'm black. Yeah. So you mind taking that conversation out of my office? But that's how I kind of handled any of yeah. the situations. Like our employees were pissed mm -hmm. about Barack Obama being president. Right. There was a handful of us who one there were, I think there were 10 black people out of 60 working at this business right. unit. But there were probably 15 people out of 60 who were Democrats. Our building people were allowed to post pictures of our president and compromising th looks and things. Wow. That I am the human resources person. Um, and they were able to talk and cuss and whatever they wanted to do about our president. And here I am uh -huh. going to the upper management team saying, hey guys, this can't happen. Yeah. Because I'm HR one. <laughs> So I have to handle it because I'm HR. Yeah, definitely. Um, and some of our employees were feeling, uh, not even black employees, but uh -huh. I got to handle this. But then I'm black and trying to handle it. Yeah, yeah. Which became a whole nother issue. Um, but at that job, unfortunately, I was making a lot of money compared to anything I ever thought that I yeah. would make in my life. And they let me know it a lot. Right. Um, they let me know that they didn't ever need an HR director. Right. Um, that my schooling and all of the things I thought I knew, um, they constantly put me in my place. Um, and it was it. It was a it was a tough tough time. And I will say this, uh, my boss who was it? So I had two bosses. I had one that was on site. Yeah. And then I had a dotted line boss who okay. is in, in HR in California. So I'm in Maryland. So they're all the way on the other side of the US. And my boss has since, um, she and I have talked since I did my talk about diversity, the one that you heard. Yeah, yeah. And um, she's apologized well, for- progress for not standing up for me uh -huh. when she knew about the things that were race related, that appeared to be race related, that I kept coming to her with. And she didn't know how to stand up for me. She's white, she's in another state. Um, and she apologized. And before, she, when I was at work and explaining these things, she would always make it so that I needed to do something different. Right. It was always so, about you. You were the problem. You were the issue kind of thing. I was the issue. And right. in turn, I spent a lot of money in training and coaching yeah. and developing myself. So when you hear Black people saying that we always have to be better and we have to work harder and have they be better educated, um, I got two master's degrees. I, I, I was going to lead on to that, but yeah, absolutely. Right. I have a certification in HR. Mm -hmm. I have a lot of training under my belt. I had to learn how to be politically correct in the office. There were so many things because every time I yeah. went to the person who's in HR, who's supposed to be protecting me, yeah. she kept making it my fault. 
it, it's you know i mean there's so many things that are there i mean you know unprofessional conduct you know springs to mind because nobody and again i've, I've worked in a variety of places as well i know you know unprofessional conduct and the talk that goes on around the office and things i was never comfortable with it because i'm more of an emotional spirit um and that's why i work for for, for myself i yeah mm -hmm. I, I don't play well with others um but um you know to, to hear things like that and uh, in some ways, we, you know, with all due respect to, to your boss or manager, you know, it, it was a weakness on her part. And, and it can be difficult, especially at that time, to stand up and say, no, I'm agreeing with Tamika because she knew in, in doing that she would probably alienate, it as her, try again, alienate herself um, over either color. And I think in a lot of ways, that's what it would come down to is the color of somebody's skin. Um, which again, I, I still find really sad. And if I can throw anything in, you know, I don't think, certainly from my experience, it's something that's just limited now to people's skin. What I found when I was a church youth worker was the higher ups were the ones that would really bully, would really manipulate, would do a lot of stuff. And it ended up where I was basically in a traumatic state. And it's only this year that I've really, you know, gotten out of it. Um, the workplace can certainly screw you up and and you know i don't think anybody should ever have to go to work and come away feeling you know like you need severe therapy or you need you know some severe counsel and unfortunately that happens um oh, yeah i mean you i mean the, the fact as well you know you were doing this by yourself you know you um you know you went on you know like so many do and bettered yourself by learning and studying one of the questions I suppose that I'm curious about, just as I'm thinking aloud, is was it, I know it's going to sound stupid, but was it easy for you to better yourself, to get an education, to learn, or was that something that there was even oppression against then because of your skin color? I don't, th I mean, it wasn't hard for me to get educated. Mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm naturally entrepreneurial in mind. Yeah. Um, so I'm always constantly wanting to learn. And I, I innately have this thing about wanting to learn people's styles and yeah. differences. Um, cost me a lot of money. Yeah, it's not cheap. <laughs> I've, I've, I'm in a lot of student loan debt because my parents couldn't pay for all of the schooling that I had. But um, things have just... It, they haven't been easy for me, but they yeah. definitely haven't been as hard as it's been for others. Yeah. So for me, I tend to look at the bright side of things. Absolutely, yeah. Often. Yeah. I, I, I can't imagine what my mom, like in her day, what yeah. she had to experience. Uh, or, or there's just so many people who are not where I am, yeah. you know? I mean, it, it, like you say, I mean, in, in some ways it hasn't been as hard as it could be um, because I've, I've talked with several people over the last couple of months and they've told stories again when they were children about their dads being dragged off, about their mums. And some of these things are just horrific things that you just think, how on earth could one human being do this to another human being? And, and like you say, I mean, some people are just really screwed up because of either what they've been taught, what they've seen, what, what's happened, what's gone on TV, you know, mm -hmm. what, what you know, type of day it is. You know, it just seems like people will start a fight with others for, for no reason. For no reason at all. And it, Which, it's, just, it's just sad. And the one thing I would like people to know is when you make it, whatever making it looks like, helping people who also would like to make it, yeah. whatever making it looks like um, is important. Definitely. Because if you didn't get there by yourself, whether it was a prayer of your family, yeah. whether it was your the support of your friends, whether it was God actually ordering yeah. your steps, you didn't do it by yourself. Absolutely. And somebody else probably can't do it by themselves either. The, the one piece of advice actually that I keep telling people, because I'm doing these interviews left, right and center, and folks keep saying to me, why are you doing these interviews with just your average Joe? I said, well, simple, because at some point, knowing the people the way that I do, I know that they are going on to much bigger and better things. And how cool is it to see that not only my friend, I built that relationship with them, but I got their first interview as well. <laughs> so, so, yeah, I got the exclusives. 
I was good and strategic on your part. But that's it. But sometimes, you know, it, it's just opening up for that opportunity. Um, you know, and I've, I've recently, uh, with the, the new Instagram page, Mind, Body and Soul, one to one. Um, and I have to laugh at this because there's a lady that I met. Um, her name is Kate. She's an Australian author. Just a wonderful, like yourself, wonderful, happy, fun, loving person, regardless okay. of all the stuff that's gone on. She's battled cancer. We're going to be talking to her in a few weeks. And um, yeah, I think it was maybe yesterday. I was thinking of different guests and I thought, oh, I should message Kate and, and see. And uh, she's her, her in, immediate response literally said, I thought you'd never ask. <laughs> and I just burst out laughing. I thought this is really, really awesome and really, really wonderful. Tamika, I want to ask you as well, what kind of questions, because again, people, I think by now are starting to get more curious, but they're terrified of asking the wrong question. I know even when I was doing this interview, and when, when I did my first interview about Black Lives Matter uh, three or four months ago, it was terrifying because as a white guy, knowing this is going to go all over the world, you know, you can be really terrified of saying the wrong thing. Um, and obviously people pick up on that, you know, perception wise and whatever else. And I said, look, guys, you know where my heart is. You know, the fact that I've grown up with, you know, every Tom, Dick and Harry, you know, that's out the window. Um, but what kind of questions would you say for people that are looking for more information that they need to start asking? Um, <laughs> Easy question. <laughs> it, it, yeah, and here's the thing. I get that it's difficult. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that's going to go away. No. But asking questions is important. Starting with what what can I do? What do you need? Yeah. Those two. Yeah. What can I do? What do you need? What do you need me to say? Um, could you let me know if I say something that is offensive? Um, when you said, you know, my heart, I do. Um, but I, I will say there are some tough people out there. I'm not one of them. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, you can ask me a question and, and I'm going to give you the answer yeah, yeah. as long as you're respectful uh, in how you ask. But I think just asking those, what do you need? What can I do? Those sorts of things is where we would have to start. I, I'm, I, and I absolutely, I think that's a great place to start. I think, you know, that um, I think historically, you know, people have used certain words and phrases that are still out there in society. You know, the hope is eventually as time goes on that they will be used less and less and less um because there's just no need for them full stop um you know and uh, i think that you know like you said when you're able to ask questions and for it to be a genuine question for a genuine curiosity people know whether you've been genuine or not um and obviously the experiences that you've gone through yourself you know whether someone's full of bs or if there's someone that's you know be, being very truthful Right. Where, where can people go because obviously the internet now is, is full of basically the biggest library on the face of the planet where can people go to find out more information about black lives matter and and how they can support things so i would say to just go to the black lives matter website okay. um to actually learn um more about black lives matter um I am going to actually, I am getting ready to do a diversity and inclusion training, a, ser a series uh, that I think will be awesome. So of course you can go to my website, yep. E-M-P-L-O-Y-A-N-D-R-E-L-A-T-E.com, employandrelate.com. Um, I'm excited about diversity and inclusion and the training that has taken a while to come up with. Um, it's not an in your face yeah. uh, sort of training. It actually is something where you'll be able to self identify where you are in this moment where diversity and inclusion is important. But I'd say, you know, if, if you wanna learn more, if you're not of color and you wanna learn more about people of color and the issues, start figuring out where how you can attend a church service yeah. online it of people of color how can you go and serve in a soup kitchen um how can you uh like where where's your comfort level yeah. 
then figure out where you can do something at that comfort level. If you don't feel comfortable going out in person to a church service, you don't want to sit there. So many of us online right now yep, having services. Absolutely. But get to know Black culture yep. a little bit. And what you'll find, I think, especially if you go to the soup kitchen, the, the Black church route, you're going to be received with open arms. Yeah. That, that's really, really great. Um, well, one of the things, it's actually just come back into my head for, from the last meeting uh, that you had, that there's, there's maybe two or three more points that we just want to do quickly. But okay. the story that you told about misconceptions of food, do you remember <laughs> this one? It, it's a funny story. We're going for the lighthearted part of the, we've, we've done the serious part now, folks, but we want to do uh, the, the lighthearted part of it because I just remember, and I burst out laughing, it was hilarious. But again, it serves a real serious thing um talk to us a little bit about that with the misconception of food when uh, what was it a, a barbecue or something that you're invited yeah like uh, sometimes people try to go way out of their way <laughs> to make black people feel included so you're gonna have fried chicken and watermelon at the event and and so we don't need that <laughs> However, if if it's your mindset, if you only have heard that black people like fried chicken and watermelon, just understand that maybe you can make it a little bit different so it doesn't stand out so much to say, here black people, here black people, here black people. Like if we like chicken, how about have some grilled chicken? And and then I I I also mentioned a watermelon salad that has some mint and some feta cheese in it. So then it, it kind of looks a little more integrated yeah. and not so black like. <laughs> um, and, and, and I was just trying to be kind of tongue in cheek. I will say that I have not met many black people who don't like fried chicken. It's just not something though that we want you to tell us, <laughs> you know? So, um, and don't make it look like you single it out and, yeah. and adding that at the table, like I made this for you. So, yes. Oh dear. I mean, it, 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 I know it's it's totally cheap. We are laughing about it, but yeah. folks, these things do happen. People literally- It happens all the time and they'll yeah. be like, I, I brought this for you. But that's, I bought it specially for you. Right. Um, and, and, oh dear. And I just, I've seen it happen. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, what, one of the funniest stories, you know, and again, I, I don't know why. When I was in Colorado, I'm sitting there with my friend. We're having breakfast. And behind me, there were three ladies who were, they must have been the cleaners in the, uh, in the hotel we were staying. Mm -hmm. It was one black lady, uh, one Hispanic lady, and one white lady. And they're sitting there. But they, I, I overheard a conversation that they were having. And to this day, it's stupid, but it still makes me laugh. Um, because the black lady had said to the other two, you know, that her boss had, had taken away her cookie, her sugar rush. This was all over a cookie. Okay. <laughs> and I was thinking, okay, I've got to listen into this conversation. Right. This sounds really interesting. Um, far better than the beautiful view that's, that's in front of me, but this sounds right. interesting. And this lady was going on a complete rant that her boss, who was white, had replaced her cookie with an apple. And the punchline, yeah, the, the punchline of this story, and I'm not going to do the accent really well, but it was so funny with, with, with um, you know, just, just the way that she spoke. Literally, I can't get a sugar rush off damn fruit. I want me a cookie. And, oh, my gosh. I literally, I don't know, for about three months, I could not. Every time I thought of this woman just made me laugh so much and it was just you know <laughs> when we're talking about uh, you know misconceptions i suppose she just wanted a cookie you know right. it's all about equality everybody should have a cookie <laughs> everybody should have a cookie give everybody a cookie everybody <laughs> oh dear it's descending into chaos tamika is there anything oh of course we haven't touched on the story where you ended up in a in a, in a big fight we, we're gonna talk uh, about that because folks have got to know the end of that story so john how are, okay, okay, I'm for 40, time. Yeah, we're okay for time. I'm 43 years old. Are you way younger than me? I'm 32, I think, at okay, the moment. So, so I don't know if you'll notice. Okay, you know who Wonder Woman is? Yes, of course. Do you know original Wonder Woman? Yes. Okay. 
And have you heard of something called underroos? Uh, I've no, I've heard that in passing, I think. So the underroos back in the day were these uh, underwear sets that they would uh, have your superhero. So you could have Superman underroos where you had a t-shirt with Superman and the underwear part with Superman. So okay. back in the day, I had Wonder Woman underroos. So this is my setup. <laughs> this is so, not where I thought the conversation was going to go. <laughs> <laughs> so these girls, uh, this girl wanted to fight me off the elementary school bus. Oh my. And, you know, after we get off the bus and as kids, they, they make a circle and the two people who are going to fight get in the middle of the huh? circle, right? So we could fight. Yeah. And I don't know how to fight. But what I do know is that I know Wonder Woman. <laughs> so what Wonder Woman used to do is she used to twirl in her circle, yep. right? With twirl in her circle. Uh -huh. And eventually, as she's turning, her outfit comes on. Yes. And the, the bangles uh -huh. and the lasso. So I thought if I just started twirling, that my I just got this visual in my head. Oh, you should. That my underoos were going to come on. My Wonder Woman underoos. <laughs> So I am twirling and, and I, <laughs> as I'm seeing my underoos are not coming on, I start twirling even faster. Like what is going on? The next thing you know, no underoos, no lasso, no bangles. I just boom, fall oh, no. on the ground. Cause I'm dizzy. Oh my word. I think everybody was like this. Nobody knew what I was doing, only in my mind. This is how we know television can have a negative impact. Because oh, yes. I just knew I was going to get some Wonder Woman powers in this world. <laughs> so needless to say, oh, once, I, once I fell out on the ground, the fight was over. Yeah. Nobody hit me. Everybody was concerned. Like, she is crazy. <laughs> and that was my one fight. Oh my word! That that is definitely worth uh, telling that story. That is incredible! Wow. Oh my goodness. Oh, we have had so much fun uh, talking in the time that we've had. Is there anything else that we haven't touched on that you would love to to talk about to touch on while we've got time? No, I just want to thank you so much for taking the time to listen to me. Um, I I would say that all people, just like I said, with employ and relate. You want to relate to people yeah. that's what everybody's looking for just to be heard and to be understood and it pays dividends um whether you're in the workplace whether it's personal um that's i think that's what we're looking for absolutely and i think that's that is a fantastic way to to wrap up the show um once again tamika if people are looking to find you find more information about you where can they find you on social media so um, if you go on to Employ Relate, Facebook slash Employ Relate, you'll find me there. And like I said, my website is employandrelate.com. And of course, they can reach out to you. And Absolutely. Yeah, we'll definitely put all the links in and everything and uh, folks can get in touch with us. Tamika, I've had a blast absolutely talking to you. It has been wonderful. It really has been yeah. awesome. Want to say a big thank you, obviously, to Tamika. And uh, if you want to get in touch with Tamika again, the links are going to be below when we put this up on YouTube and above when we put, it, put this up on Facebook. If you want to get in touch with me and check out my brand new book, The Battles We All Face, you can get in touch with us at thebattlesweallface.com. On Instagram at Mind, Body, and Soul One to One. Don't forget to hit that uh, like button. And if you've got any questions for us, of course, please do feel free to write them in the comment section below. Of course, you can get in touch with us as well at johnmorrisartfromtheheart.com if you'd like to see some very stunning artwork that will make your walls jealous. Um, you can come and visit us there. And if you've got any questions, again, we're here to help. And uh, tell a friend and subscribe to our channel because it's the only way our little channel can grow. And again, want to thank Tamika so much for this uh, wonderful time. We really, really do appreciate it. Until next time, guys, we're out of time. Take care. God bless. And I'll see you soon.